Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, I'm your host Dane Cobain, this is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed for a weekly album review and we play local unsigned and or independent music. As always you can find us on Facebook, if you search for the Arch Show on Wickham Sound you should be able to find us. We are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcast. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. You can also email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So this week we've got something a little bit different. I am chatting to the run directors of uh, High Wickham, Wickham Rye Park Run, uh, something I've been taking part in recently. It's a 5K, um, you know, fun run, weekly fun run, weekly timed event, uh, all, all sorted by charity. It's good stuff. Just Google Parkrun. You'll find out more and you can just listen to us chat to them as well. But before we do that, we are going to head over to uh, the, the Rylight Zone to catch up with the latest instalment of uh, Insomniac by myself, Dane Cobain. Nana Knight made another appearance that evening. This time she visited Kate in a dream. They met at midnight in a field of swaying wheat sheaves. The sky was stained sepia and the clouds were black and ominous. Kate recognised the scene from a painting she'd seen in a museum, but she couldn't remember where the museum was, and she wondered if it had any significance. Kate, her grandmother cooed, I told you I'd be back. The younger woman felt the familiar flash of ice-cold fear pass through her, only this time it was somehow worse. This time, she found herself in an unfamiliar landscape, lost inside a dream, and she remembered the story she'd heard of people being killed in dreams and dying for real. Not that she thought Nana Knight was going to kill her, She got the feeling that the malevolent old woman had something else in mind. What do you want from me? she asked. What makes you think I want something? the old woman replied. Kate noticed that, in the dream at least, she wasn't wearing her dentures. Her lips made a disgusting fap-fap sound as she puckered up her mouth to form hard consonants. Then why are you here? Kate asked. Nana Knight beckoned her closer with a gnarly finger and despite herself, Kate inched towards her, pushing her way through the phantasmagorical wheat like she was swimming through a field of gold. Can you hear me? Nana Knight whispered. Kate leaned in closer still. I hear you, she replied. Look out for Zeb, her grandmother urged. Don't trust him. Who's Zeb? No questions, she snapped. Our time here is short. Okay, Kate said. Her voice had dropped too, and their whispers danced on the air and swished through the dream field like paper aeroplanes. I'll be careful. You don't understand, Nana Knight insisted. Zeb is evil. Ancient evil. He took your... And then her alarm went off, and she woke back up. Week 17, day 4. Kate was back at the doctor's. She would planned to tell him about her weird, vivid dreams, about her nighttime rendezvous with her grandmother and how the old woman had appeared beside her bed one night. But then she worried that Dr. Karnataka might think she was crazy, and she didn't want that. She just wanted him to make her better. It never occurred to her that telling him the truth might facilitate the process. Hmm, Karnataka said. He was doing complicated things to her arm while she stared stoically ahead. Can't find a vein. Sorry, Kate replied, though she wasn't. Just get it over with. I hate needles. You might have to get used to them, the doctor replied. He smiled apologetically at her, and she caught the movement out of the corner of her eye. Until we figure this out, we're going to have to keep testing. What's wrong with me? I don't know, the doctor admitted, but I promise I'm going to do everything I can to find out. Any loss of appetite? None at all, Kate said, thinking of the carrot cake that her mother had forced her to eat a couple of weekends earlier. She'd enjoyed it so much that she'd started stocking up and was getting through three of the things a week. That was on top of the takeaways when she was too lethargic to cook, and the bags of crisps that she'd stockpiled in her snack cupboard. Well, Karnataka told her, I've got some good news and some bad news. Which would you like to hear first? The good news, Kate said. The good news is that you've got high blood pressure and an elevated heart rate. That's the good news. Afraid so, the doctor said. The bad news is that until we get the lab tests back, there's nothing more I can tell you. What about medication? Kate asked. There must be something you can give me. Are you still taking your tamazepam? Of course, Kate said. I'll give you another prescription, Karnataka replied, but once we figure out what's wrong, I want to take you back off it. We shouldn't leave you on it for too long. Hmm, Kate murmured. She thought back over the last couple of weeks. It had just been night after sleepless night. Any chance you could increase the dosage? Week 19, day 3. Karnataka had refused to up the dosage, so Kate had settled on a different plan of action. 
She dropped herself down to half her usual dosage and kept the spare medication in her jewellery box. When she needed it, really needed it, she double or triple dosed. She knew it was a bad idea, but she also didn't give a sh If she woke up in the emergency room, well, she'd deal with that if it came to it. She'd triple dosed for several nights in a row and had been feeling sluggish for days, which hadn't reflected well at the Dole office. Still, she'd finally secured an interview as a night clerk at the local hospital, which struck her as ironic, and things were looking up. And then she heard another voice, a different one. It couldn't have been her grandma, unless her grandma had a particularly sore throat and had started to speak with an unusual accent, something it was impossible for Kate to place that reminded her of old black and white movies and the lonely sound of a violin in a thunderstorm. I've been watching you, the voice said. That was the latest instalment of Insomniac by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. Son, take my word, that guy will be the end of you. So if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too, you better leave that that gal alone. There's no telling what they might do. Oh, your wife is like an arm, always by your side. Your sweetheart's like your legs that take you for a ride. The third one's like your liver after a gal to buy you. Oh, you're never sure what it might do. So if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too, you better leave that third gal alone. No jiving, leave that third gal alone. will be crazy for all that you do the third one's got blades for hands and a fork for a tongue you call her yours your death is soon to come so if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too you better leave that third gal alone there's no telling what they might do what damage on you might be sprung but there was a gal called emily green she was the kindest gal i had ever seen she went with a man called Piggly Bill And though he only had one leg She loved him still She met his wife Which she didn't mind But when she met his outside women She wasn't so kind She burst down the boar slice And both limb from limb And then put them in his bed And slipped poison in his gin So if you've got a wife and a sweetheart too You better leave that bad gal alone That was Leave the Third Gal Alone by Big Nose Thomas. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to be joined in conversation now by this week's guests, who are the run directors from uh, Wickham Rye Park Run. So the, the, my traditional opening question is, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? I could start you on that one. It was, this made me laugh. It's called Instant, Instant Pot for Beginners. I mean, Taz knows what that is, but it's, it's basically a cookbook. Um, do you know what an instant pot is, Dane? Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, I, I kind of know the things. Like, uh, is it a bit like a slow cooker? Yeah, it's like an electric um, pressure cooker, slow cooker, all in one with lots of press buttons. You can do programs and stuff on it. So, it's, I, I needed a book to help me run it because it was a bit complicated. <laughs> it's quite a good book, actually, although it's been translated into sort of UK version from America with sort of strange ingredients and measurements like cups and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But it works, so it's fine. So I was quite happy with it. Awesome. And Taz, have you got have you got an answer? Yes. So not the instant pot one. Um, I just finished recently um, Clara and the Sun. I don't know whether you've 
heard of that one, Dane. So that's um, I've heard of it. Yeah, it's a scientific, a sci-fi stroke dystopian story about an AI, um, an AI friend and her uh, human, essentially. So it's quite an interesting one. I recommend that one. Don't, awesome. don't give too much away. So I won't give in too much of the detail. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I'm 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 fascinated by that kind of stuff, and it's quite topical as well. What with you know increasing sort of discourse about AI in in the news and whatnot. Um, but yeah, cool, awesome. Well, I want to get onto the topic, the main topic of our interview, which is obviously going to be Parkrun. And I thought a good place to start would be: um, Can you define what is Parkrun and how can people get involved in it? Yeah, you go. I mean, it's a difficult one to describe, really. But I'll give Taylor go first. <laughs> Um, so Parkrun, so I guess the, the I guess the official kind of tagline, as it were, it's, it's a free weekly timed run or walk, actually, in, in your local park. And it's a 5K distance. Um, like I said, you can walk it, you can run, you can actually volunteer as well. So you don't have to do anything physical in that way. And it's for everyone from all backgrounds, all levels of fitness. And it's... Um, I would say Parkrun is a community. That's how I'd describe it. It's definitely a community thing. And I think the only ability you need to take part is the ability to get to the start line by nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. That's it, basically. So anybody can turn up and do it uh, in any shape or form. Well, and, and I wanted to ask that kind of community vibe to it. Um, you know, what opportunities are there for people to socialise? Because I think... It could be easy for people to think you show up, you do your run and you head home, you know. But I mean, you know, Parkrun's kind of designed in such a way that not that you have to socialise, but it gives you those opportunities, you know, with the marshals or when you're getting your finished token scanned or whatever it is, you know, you can it gives people those kind of opportunities to socialise. So I wondered, you know, what, what opportunities do you think there are for maybe somebody who's going along to it by themselves? I think, I mean, the first time I went to Parkrun, I thought it'd be... No, nobody would speak to you or whatever. And it'd be like going on a tube in London. If you speak to someone, they think <laughs> some sort of weirdo. But, you know, some guy spoke to me when I rocked up at the first park run ever. I did. And I went, well, you know, this is OK. And then there's loads of people talking to you and you're sort of clapped on the way around by the marshals and clapped at the end as you got there. And I thought, well, this is OK. You know, it's very sort of welcoming. And you may, it makes you feel part of the gang, if you like, and part of the community and part of what's going on. Yeah, similar to Bob, the first, <clears throat> the first park run that I attended at Wickham Rye um I had lots of people who didn't know who were cheering me on and I felt like oh this was a nice place to be so I really really enjoyed it and I, and I came came back and I kept coming back and also with, kind of in terms of socializing um you know you you meet other volunteers you get to talk to them um and you know learn a little bit about them there's also um try to do like a post park run coffee so people go to the cafe at the park some people go to Starbucks a bit further away but also that aspect as well if you want it so that's there as well yeah and I think that feeds into um something that I I think's you know quite important to cover um you know I cover quite a lot on the show sort of things like mental health um and I wondered like how important do you think things like running and maybe particularly park run are for you know uh, people who are maybe struggling with their mental health I think I think any any kind of physical activity, any type of social interaction can really help go go towards some way in improving someone's mental health. Sometimes we can speak to some of the volunteers, um, kind of get to learn that sometimes that's probably the first time they've spoken to somebody all week. So you yeah. there as another runner, volunteer, whatever you might be going there for, um, it really helps the other person that they have someone to speak to um, as well. And obviously, just going to caveat with the fact that, you know, the way activities can help somebody is very individual. So obviously, please seek, you know, mental health support if, if you need if you need support. Um, they can affect people in different ways. But it's um, I said it before, it's the community and that kind of helps people as well. It helps you to meet new people um, and that can go a long way towards your mental health as well. I think, it, I mean, it is good because, you know, if I'm run directed down there and I'm wondering about, I always chat to everybody I pass by, say, hello, how's it going? Well, how many have you done now, sort of thing, and all that sort of stuff, you know, and it makes people feel part of it. And if they've spoken to no one, as Taz said, for a whole week, you know, at least yeah. someone's there talking to them and 
they feel part of what's going on. And I've seen people sort of, when they've turned up for the first one ever and been completely lost, and now they've got lots of people that chat to them every week and, and so on. No, it's really, it's really helpful for them, I think. Although, you know, as Taz said, if they've got problems, they should seek proper professional help. But it gets yeah. them out in the open air, vitamin N, all that stuff for at least an hour in on a Saturday morning. Does no, it's good. It's good for the sort of soul, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and you mentioned, and and you know, you're quite right to say that you know, if you do need that that professional help to to seek it out. But one of the interesting things that I've noticed is um, kind of increasing numbers of of like doctors, general practitioners. Uh, they like prescribe park runs now, don't they? Like they and they'll they'll say to their you know their um their patients, you know, well, you know, if you do need to get some more physical activity or you do just need to get out of the house, um, you know, they'll recommend it. And I've even seen you know partnerships between doctor surgeries and park runs and things as well. Um, and I think that hints maybe towards you know park runs place again. We've mentioned this a little bit, the community, but um, you know, as a, as a part of that of that wider community. There is a GP practice thing. I mean, Taz can tell you all about this because she's been involved in doing this. Yes, it's the Parkrun Practice Initiative where um, Parkrun um, GP practice can, pra can partner with the local uh, Parkrun, and then they can and it can work two ways. So the practice can um, uh, volunteer at the local Parkrun, get involved that way. But like I said about the social prescribing, GPs can essentially prescribe. Uh, patients the patients come to park run um, again it could just be for walking it could be for even if it's just for volunteering us but they might not want to walk or or um, run and again it's that being around other people which can help people's mental health and it's also I think Bobby touched on it it's about being out in nature there's so much um, that can help as well being out in the nature seeing the greenery being out in the fresh air can go a long way as well I think about to helping someone well, and and you you mentioned as well a few times the idea that you know you can walk, you can jog, you can run, um, and I think one of the important things about parkrun is that nobody comes last. And so I wondered, can you kind of let us know, describe the role of a tail walker basically? What is a tail walker? <laughs> they're, the, they're the last person in the orange high vis out on the course, so nobody comes last apart from the tail walkers. Okay, they get their volunteer credit for coming out and doing a tail walk, but everyone finishes in front of them. And we always encourage them not to walk right behind the people that are right at the back of the field anyway. So they don't interfere with them. They just let them get on with it themselves. That's, you know, it's one of the key things in one of the blurbs from Park, park Run is you know, nobody ever finishes last and there is no time limit. So you can take as long as you like. I mean, some people take over an hour at Wickham. And, but we're happy with that. We're good with that. We don't mind. We're still there at the end to clap them in. I did see, I saw, I can't remember which park run, but I saw one that they'd posted, um, you know, just to let you know this week, there will be a, there will be a time limit enforced at the end of the course because we need to be ready to do it again next week. So they'd given people, I think like six days, 23 hours and 30 minutes to get to the end of the course, which <laughs> oh, is, I thought one. was quite funny. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Well, and, and, and again, I think that kind of, that kind of hints back to the idea, you know, park runners, people look, they're keen to beat their personal best but I don't think there's ever really you don't really get that sense of competition it's not like I'm going you know I'm I'm going into a race if if you do see it as a race it's kind of a race with yourself you know well, there is yeah, a fair bit of competition yeah. at the back I mean the back of the field some of those walkers you know that no, I'm going to, I'm going to crack 50 minutes this week you know and it's quite competitive down the back there I mean we're not talking the 15 minute guys at the front some of these walking guys are, and girls are quite competitive as well, and they definitely go at it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's all that about your. It's kind of your, about your own kind of goal setting and your own achievements. And you yeah. mentioned tail walker. We also have a park walker, which is some, but is people who are they wear the blue high visits and they're in between um, kind of the first runners walkers and and um, before the tail walker, and they're just there to encourage people to walk so um so we have that as well so you you know it's, it's completely okay to walk around um park run too yeah i mean i i think as well and maybe we'll we can touch on this now but to me that seems like the ideal first volunteer role um because again it helps you to get to know the course there's no pressure it's not as though you're you know trying to set a pace or you know you're not you're not 
you know timekeeping and feeling the feeling the the sort of the pressure of doing a really you know really good job but i wonder could you could you outline um sort of the different volunteer roles that you guys that well that any park run i suppose has available yeah i can i can kick us off so there's there's a lot of roles and I guess any any could be a uh, first a first one. It just depends what you're comfortable with. So we have I guess the key roles we have are the marshals. They are um, the eyes and ears of of the run directors. Um, so they're there to support um, the runners as they runners and walkers as they go through the course. Um, but they can also report back any any if any incidents have happened along the way. But they're mostly to encourage the runners to kind of um, and walkers to make their way through the course. We also have the barcode scanners and they will be at the end of the course scanning you through um, to get your time. We'll also have, talking of time, timekeepers, their role is to time um, each one are coming through and what you all need for that is, is a mobile phone. Um, we also have, um, oh, I missed. Tokens, people, people with tokens. Yeah, tokens. So we have finished tokens. Uh, so the people who will give out the finished tokens, and we also have the finished token support who will give the token to the finished token person to hand them out. Um, we also have actually a, um, a volunteer coordinator, and this person will job. Their job is to encourage people to volunteer for the following weeks, and also we have uh, people who are part of the core team. So they're the, like the run directors. They are those who are in charge um, on the day that Parkrun is. And we also have a funnel manager who helps keep the finished funnel um, flowing. And I hope I haven't missed anyone, <laughs> any, any roles. I can't think of any others. No, I mean, pe people are a bit, a bit scared of some of the roles. I mean, timekeeping is one they're all very scared of. <laughs> but if I was doing, I'd be more scared of writing a report in case I did, you know, wrote something very terrible people didn't like, you know. But there's, there's nothing that's difficult to do because when you turn up on the day, if you've never done it before, you'll get a briefing on what to do. You'll get a demo at a time or whatever you want. And if you're out on the course marshalling, you'll get a lanyard with the instant response instructions on it and where to stand. Um, we, we call them Ben yards, but you know, for a particular reason, because there's a guy, called, one of our run directors called Ben, is on the pictures of all of them with his arm pointing in the right direction so you know where to go. <laughs> so it, you know it's all very sort of easy to do and you know i think people, i mean i personally enjoy the volunteering as much as the running because it's yeah. good standing out there clapping your hands shouting at people yeah. and you get i mean on saturday i was there 476 people passed by the number of people that shouted hello bob how are you doing and i don't know half their names you know but yeah. i've seen them running around park run but they know who i am and it's the same with people like taz and all the other run directors you know we're known yeah. even though we don't know who they are you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with the team from Wickham Rye Park Run, and this is Fabulous Parfait with Crocodile. Crocodile, mon gentil cro. Crocodile, épargne-moi les larmes sur. So 
Oh mais arrête, franchement crocodile tu me fatigues là Oh puis y'a plus rien qui marche, y'a plus rien du tout Oh il fait trop chaud aussi, on crève ici Tiens c'est quoi Romain Crocodile, crocodile c'est ce que tu fais, reste, assis, couché, couche panier That was Crocodile by Fabulous Parfait. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to be rejoined in conversation now by the run directors from Wickham Rye Park Run. Yeah, and I think as well, like, it does make a big difference to the experience as a runner. I mean, I remember a couple of months back, somebody had, um, I think they were volunteering with, like, their son or their daughter, and they'd made a sign, like, one of the speed mushrooms from Super Mario, from Mario Kart, and they were encouraging people to, like, touch the sign as they went past to kind of give them a speed boost. And just little things like that. There's the guy, uh, I don't know his name, the guy who's always uh, with the boom box, who's always encouraging yes. people. And I I hear, because I, I, I walk to... Um, like I just I you know live about a mile away so I walk to the course um and then I kind of on my way home I overhear quite often people talking about how the run went and things and he's like the number one thing I hear overhear people <laughs> talking about being like did you see the guy with the boom box did you see the guy with the boom box yeah um and it, again I think it does it helps to motivate you no matter what speed you're, you're at whether you are one of those yeah. 15 minute people whether you're whether you're walking around uh it, it kind of makes you feel again like part of a part of a group I think yeah. yeah well, Kenny's quite famous. I mean, his house overlooks uh, the Steps of Doom. Mm. And that's when he first popped up. And now he's sort of all over the place every week and people expect him to be there and they're sort of yeah. mystified if he doesn't show up. Yeah, yeah, I'd be disappointed. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And just to point out, Kenny, Kenny isn't a park run volunteer. He's just a member of the public who sees what we do. And he just loves to support us um, yeah. in that way and just stand in his favourite spot and um, encourage us all. Um, you mentioned earlier the importance of kind of getting out about out and about in nature. So uh, the park run is at Wickham Rye. I wondered if you could describe the course to us. I think basically it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a course of three parts, isn't it? There's the first bit from the start round to the path by the river, which is sort of long, often boggy grass, because it's never used for football pitches or whatever. Once you get onto the concrete or the tarmac up towards Busy Bees, all around that way, it's just tarmac and paths. Um, it's nice running along the dike there because you've got a view of the dike looking down through the trees, dodging the squirrels and whatever else. <laughs> and down past the waterfall, if you've got time, you can look at the egrets on the side there on the waterfall. And then you come onto the other field, which is a bit more shorter grass because it's football pitches around the steps of doom which is where most people go wrong. They think, oh, if I can get up the steps, it's done. But then when you get to the top of the steps, it's still going up, and that catches lots of people out. Um, and then you're coming on the way back through all the rest of it. So it's a very mixed course. Um, it's like, you know, there, I mean, there are 1,243 park runs in the UK, and everyone's different. Yeah. So, you know, it's a unique course in by itself. I don't know if Taz got anything else to add about the course. No, I think that, I think you explained it really well. And... We have, you know, we have tourists come from different parts of the UK and one of the kind of the most common words we hear about our park when it's that it's been very friendly. And I think we're really proud of ourselves, pride ourselves in knowing that we are actually one of the friendliest park runs out there. So do come and join us if you haven't done so already. Awesome. Well, it's, it's funny because um, I think I said to you in the, in, uh, the emails, Taz, so I've recently caught the the park run tourism bug. So I've been yeah. kind of going around and trying to see a few different courses um and i think i've picked spectacularly well it depends how you want to look at it i've either picked really well or really badly because the two uh the two around here anyway the two additional yeah. courses i've done i've done wickham rye that's my home run yeah. um i've done tamworth castle grounds which is um where i'm where i'm originally from so i went around there over christmas and then i recently did um uh the one in amersham uh church mead and church then mead, the yeah. one in and the one in Henley and um, both of those it turns out both of those have massive hills uh two lap two laps as well so two laps that yep. involve going up massive hills <laughs> um but funnily enough while I've been chatting to people at both of those um at both of them I chatted to people who'd been to Wickham Wright and the general consensus was now that they've been up those massive hills they're not going to complain about the steps at Wickham Rye anymore because they're actually not that bad, you know, compared to going up a massive hill, you know, they're not that, they're not that bad. 
you just got to be prepared for them i think you know yeah church, church, did, um... is probably, church is probably the steepest one around these parts especially yeah. when it's in the winter you've got about two to twice up that slippery cobbly, cobbly part of the field at the bottom well and i wanted to ask you like what are some of your other favorite courses other than uh, wickham rye for me i say locally would be black park that'd be my next favorite one and i just did one um this saturday and that was in edinburgh that was hollywood that's definitely not flat it it has got quite a big incline a very long incline but um really really enjoyed it so that's probably my, my second my second best one and my favorite one um is brooklands down in woking that's probably it's only half an hour from here and that's on the old airfield there and i like that because it's got a curly whirly um there's an old go-kart track and you run around in a spiral basically and when they do the briefing, because it's an old airfield, they do the briefing as if you're on a plane. The guy stands on a box and does, you know, the, the emergency exits are here, there and everywhere and all this <laughs> stuff. That's really funny. Um, out of the area, I think Conway in Wales, uh, North Wales, near Land, not know, is my sort of furthest away favourite at the moment because you do, it's an out and back, you go out and back towards the castle and out and back along the estuary. And it's, it's fab in sunny weather. I wouldn't recommend it in the winter, but it's great in the sort of sunny weather in the summer. Cool. Okay. And so uh, just a couple more questions to end on. One thing that I think Parkrun does really well, and, um, you know, every Parkrun you go to does this, but I think Wickham Ride, you know, does, does more than their fair share of this is uh, they like to shout out when it's people's, when people are um, achieving milestones. So um, what are sort of some of the milestones that people work towards and how do you help people to celebrate them? Yeah, so we have the, we have milestones for volunteering and the number of runs or walks that you've done so it could be from 50 100 250 500 um I think there's 25 that aren't for juniors if i'm not mistaken but there's quite a few you can get um and the way we help uh to, be, well, to celebrate as if we kind of give them a shout out um um as well at the beginning of park run but also a shout out um, if we, if we know kind of birthdays and those kind of milestones too, and um, we also or we try to encourage um, celebrate lots of cake as well. <laughs> yeah, we do an official milestones as well. I mean, you've got, Tad said you got the twenty five, the fifty, the one hundred, the two fifty, and five hundred. But you know, say you get to a three hundred, that's an unofficial one. We celebrate that as well. Give a shout out, and there are there are people all over the place, particularly around anywhere that look for milestones on the results every week. And there's a website which yeah. brings up results, um, milestones coming up and stuff like that. And the other thing I think, I don't know if we're allowed to mention this, but you can probably edit it out if we're not, um, is, the, is the challenges in Parkrun. Have you come across that at all? Yeah, I've seen some of those, yeah. Yeah, the things like the alphabet and stuff like that. Yeah. That, that motivates lots of people and we you know we, you'll see people we give shout outs to people like that down there um, that have done their half cow and their cow which is 50 and 100 different locations and stuff like that so they're then and you'll see them with the t-shirts on with the 50 locations yeah, yeah. printed on the back you must have, you've probably seen those running about so all those sort of things um and something i discovered today which was quite interesting because the app is in, the 5k app is independent of park run people subscribe to it and I looked through the list of subscribers, and Paul Paul Hinton, uh, Paul Hinton Stewart, or whatever his name, Stuart Hinton, the guy that founded Park Run, is a sponsor of that app. So, you know, we're doing a lot of good work for Park Run for free, basically. Which and yeah. I think it's good because a lot of people virtually plan their whole week and weekends around you know, these various sure. challenges and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you're, you've done it. You've got four letters of the alphabet already, so you've only got a few to go yeah yeah exactly yeah but Z, Z, you have to go to like poland or um or um <laughs> holland don't you say <laughs> and there's yeah, no way to Z. <laughs> go to zoo park, park in holland that's the best one well, i need yeah. to go for my Z. <laughs> yeah yeah no one one day hopefully you know but it does it does kind of motivate you and, and it's actually a really nice way as well of you know going out and seeing more places and you know with myself i'll go along go along alone and like you know like last week when I went to Henley I wouldn't normally just 
randomly go to Henley. Um, I, you know, I've been a few times with a purpose or whatever, but it's nice to have Parkrun as my purpose. Went along and then afterwards, you know, I went for a little browse around the charity shops to look for some books and things and, you know, had a nice little day out that I, I wouldn't otherwise have had. Um, but you mentioned people who kind of build their weekend around it. You know, I've seen some of these parkrun tourism groups uh, and, you know, the, the metric that a lot of the apps use is, is Nendi, isn't it? It's the nearest event not done yet, I think it stands yeah. for. And, and there was like somebody I saw who said, I think they're on an 88 event streak of doing their like one Nendi after another. Oh, wow. And at this point, it's like the, the, like the nearest ones, I think it said like 120 kilometers away. And I'm oh, like, wow. geez, you know, that's <laughs> that's commitment to, to do that, to know every Saturday mm-hmm. you're going to do at least 100, well, at least a 200 kilometer round trip. Yeah. for your you know for an event that as you say it, it it takes an hour out of your saturday it's probably going to take them four hours to get there yeah <laughs> and back again to do, <laughs> to do their one hour event but um you know people love it and fair play to them i, I like it on a saturday morning to make a trip of it you know i'll go there um do the park run find a nice breakfast somewhere look at some shops if they're any about or you know whatever else is going on around the area like you said for henley you know it's yeah. it's part of the thing but there are people yeah. that do. I mean, I know, know one of my friends is a football fan and they follow their teams. Wherever they yeah. go, they do a park run in the morning and the football match in the afternoon. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's, that's part of their, their weekend life. And they'll travel was, hundreds um, of miles to do it. Yeah. Well, there was a... Um because I've, I've been listening to the uh, like the audio zine of the Parkrun magazine, because yeah. uh, they've turned it into like, I guess, kind of like a podcast. Uh, but there was a guy on there, I can't remember who he was, he was an actor. And he said like, while he was on tour around the UK on this stage show, he made that commitment that every Saturday morning he was going to do the nearest Parkrun. Um, and he ended up like getting some of his, his cast members involved and stuff as well. But that seems like another nice way to do it. Because, you know, if you're going to be yeah. touring around anyway, you might, you know, you might as well. Well, I think there's, it's it's difficult to go somewhere in the UK now where there's not a park run. That's the thing. Yeah. You could yeah. go to any big town and there'll be a park run there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, which, you know, which, cool. is, which is great. And I think you know, they're making making this big push now to keep expanding it. I mean, there were seventy six new park runs in the UK last year, yeah. which is a lot yeah. of park runs. And you know, plus they're trying to expand now into more than the twenty countries they've already got. Yeah. So it's you now it's on the rise still, yeah, which is sure. which is great. Well, I think Australia recently they had their one millionth registered mm-hmm. runner, or one. I can't, I'm not sure what they judged it on, whether it was registrations or scanned finishes or or what it was, but they hit a million anyway. Yes. Yeah, well, they had they, they had the first guy last week. I think it was a week before. First guy who was over a hundred years old to complete a park run in Australia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That that was pretty amazing. I think it's the first yeah, guy worldwide who's over a hundred to do a park run. And, and the, the, I just want to ask uh, two two last questions because one thing we uh, touched on we mentioned um, junior park run. So can you just give us the lowdown on that and uh, you know how kids and parents can get involved in that? Yeah, so junior park run happens every Sunday and that's at nine o'clock again at the Rye, but further down from where we start for, for the five k on Saturdays. Um, so the junior park run is is just two k and it's for four to fourteen year olds. Um, and so, yeah, parents can get involved uh, in terms of volunteering if they wish to as well. And children just turn up and run um, or walk. Um, it's lots of fun on a Sunday. Um, I'm a run director for, this, for the juniors as well. Um, and one of our teams one of the, is one of the event directors. Um, but yeah, a whole lot of fun. And it's so, um, it's really wonderful to see the children enjoying themselves and having a great time um, doing it as well. Awesome. Cool. And um, the last question I just want to end on is, uh, and this is, again, my generic ender, um, whether you guys will have an answer, because it might just be more of the same. But what's next for you and where can people follow you to find out more? So I guess wh- where's best to follow Wick and Rye Park from? So Wick and Rye Park Run, you can find us on Facebook um, as Wick and Rye Park Run. We are on um, Instagram as well. We are on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, so you can find us on there too. And also, if you if you Google Wickham Rye Parkrun, you'll find our official Parkrun page too. Big thank you to the team from Wickham Rye Parkrun for joining me. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Chameleon with Here Is All We Need. Since the 
From their lips, they don't hear him say. See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix. It only breaks us like twigs. Don't untie. See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix. It only breaks us like twigs. Don't untie. Because of this mix alone, they break 
was Bundle of Sticks by Waterfall, and before that we had Here Is All We Need by Chameleon. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Oak Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Uriah Heep, Revelations, the Uriah Heep Anthology. In the early 70s, Uriah Heep was a heavy rock band that was bottom of the first division, behind Zeppelin, Purple and Sabbath. The problem was that for a heavy rock band, they were just not that heavy. They tended to do lengthy pieces that were almost power ballads. They were a bit like a progressive rock band, but nowhere near as agile as Yes, or as far out as Pink Floyd. Their epic songs were a bit like big 60s numbers, like Barry Ryan's Eloise, or even MacArthur Park. They were more poppy than Deep Purple were at the time. They were more like Deep Purple's 1960s output. What they lacked in heavy rock blues power, they made up for in melody. Though the lyrics were very much of their time, the tunes are big. They had a great singer, but he sounded like an old-fashioned great singer, and not like Ian Gillan or Robert Plant. The things they did have, that were not a big plus for me at the time, were a big swirling Hammond organ and perfectly executed harmony vocals. In my later years, I came to love the sound of the Hammond organ in rock bands, much preferring it to the synthesizers that took over from it. But it is the harmonies that now please me most. They were an influence on Queen. They come at you as solid stacks of high operatic layered voices, like vocal orchestral stabs. Uriah Heep were always out of favour with the music press, but their first three albums were quite popular. In advance of their fourth album, they released a song called Easy Living that is still one of my favourite heavy rock singles. It should have been a big hit, like Sabbath's Paranoid, Purple's Black Knight, Hawkwind's Silver Machine, or Alice Cooper's School's Out, but it wasn't. They were never again in the top tier. Drink and Drugs ended their classic lineup. Though I think they still exist, though with only one original member, the guitarist. I got this CD in a bargain bin, and it has some great songs, all played and sung very well. All produced to the highest standards of the time. It would be a truly great compilation if it had contained Salisbury, the groundbreaking sidelong epic from their second album. A piece with an orchestra where the orchestra played with the band, as opposed to the Deep Purple Concerto, where mostly the band and orchestra played separately. Revelations. Uriah Heap. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to the team from Wickham Rye Park Run for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We are repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. And you can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune. This is the incredible Simon Gregory with Call of Duty. I'll catch you next week. Summers, I could ride and I could shoot And I ventured to the county fair alone The sergeant in the army tent had shillings on his drum And his stories and the ale called to me And before I knew it, I'd received my shilling and a gun Off to fight the French for my king and country It wasn't just the foe who saw us coming As we marched in line with rifles in our hands And 
slaughtered boys who look like us but spoke another tongue to decide which rich man got to rule the land. Rule the land. Centuries on, it's still the same. Everything's different, but nothing's changed. I wasn't good at school, and I couldn't find a job that required all the skills I learned at home. A life of watching movies, playing Xbox, flying drones doesn't fit you. For a standard office club But I'd seen all the recruitment advertising Let us make you into all that you can be And before I knew it I'd received a bus cut and a gun And the rest is military history To last a lifetime They never said how long that life would be and Those of us who made it back We're not the boys who left our homes To answer to the call of our duty The promise we come back covered in glory We'd be heroes and our country would be proud as work for men who've seen too much and can't forget the things they've done and blood spill on that foreign ground and it wasn't just the foe who saw us coming as we stood there with our papers in our hands it wasn't in the desert or the field or in the trench But on the home from where we took our final stand It wasn't just the foe who saw us coming As we stood there with our papers in our hands It wasn't in the desert or the field or in the trench But on the home from where we took our final Stand. The final stand. Who rules the land? Who makes the choice? Who makes the profit? Who pays the price?